All right, hey, how is everybody? Good, hey, my name is uh, Doug Moore. I'm in charge of the student ministry here at Emerald Coast Fellowship, if you do not know who I am. Um, just so you know, make sure you're in the right place. Dr. Steve Taylor, our senior pastor, is doing a Next Steps in the room right back there. In that is where he talks about the vision of the church, and he talks about um, what we... Uh, kind of how we disciple people and how we help you become everything that God wants you to be. Um, there's other small groups meeting all over campus, children's ministry activity, and then I look like a sweaty mess because I just came from the pole barn and uh, where it's um, a billion degrees in there, right, out there right now. So, um, and if you, if you get near me, I probably smell like taco meat because that's what they're eating over there. But um, it's not Kevin's lasagna, I'll be honest. Um, but hey, thank you guys for being here. If this is where you're supposed to be, we're going to go ahead and get started. If, like I said, if you're in Next Steps, go ahead and head that way. Miss Christie's right there, and she'll take you where you need to be. But um, so if you've been around, so in here tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of talk about some research that I have done over really over the past three years, but pretty in depth over the last uh, nine months or so. And I'm not going to bore you with statistics. We're not going to do deep dives into stuff that you don't care about and I'm not an expert in. But what I hope to do is kind of talk to you about three transitions that every family that has an adolescent will go through. In America, regardless of what part of the country you are, what race you are, what, um, what religious following you have, you will go through the transitions from elementary school into middle school, middle school into high school, and high school into young adulthood or college. And whether, and right now in Bay County, there are a lot of families going through these transitions. My family is going through two big transitions. My youngest son started kindergarten um, yesterday. And I, my oldest son is now one of my teenagers at the rec. So he is in his first official rec worship center um, with Alex Gentili right now. So I'm excited about what he's doing. I'm excited about what Garrett's getting to do or, or Dylan's getting to do in the, in the kids' ministry. But a lot of you guys have children or grandkids either in one of these transitions or through, or, or have about to go through one of these transitions. So before we kind of get, get going with the, the main point tonight, you guys, a lot of you that have been around Emerald Coast know what this means. Dr. Steve and I like to pull these out every year in August, and, and we do a big sermon on it, and at the end, mamas are crying, and it's fantastic. It's, we, we hit home. It's, it's what my mom, the mo, my mom used to be a kindergarten teacher, and her goal at the end of the spring musical was to have every mom in the room crying because she knew she did her job, right? So that's not our goal. But what we try to do when we bring out these marbles is we try to reinforce that your time is limited with your kids. Like you have 936 weeks from birth until most of your kids will launch into adulthood. And that varies depending on when they start school and how long they stay at the home. But on average, it's about 936 weeks. What starts with this cuddly newborn, where you think you have all the time in the world, you don't. Because you blink and they're crawling. You blink and they're teething and you're not sleeping. You blink and they have their first ear infection and you're like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into, right? And then you blink again and they hit, you have 676 weeks left when they hit kindergarten. In kindergarten, um, little league starts, t-ball starts, wee ball starts. My five-year-old is playing soccer and for the first time in his life, he has a jersey that actually belongs to him and not one of his brothers. Some of you moms know what I'm talking about. You just pass those things on down, right? Doesn't matter what team or what color. Here's your jersey, son. And uh, then you go through um, elementary school. You go through your first end-of-year testing. They make it through kindergarten, first grade, um, second grade, third grade. Then eventually you blink and the big transition for parents happens. What, thir over 30 sixth graders are making this transition at the rec right now, this week, right? 30 of them. And uh, so then you, you, we hit middle school where we, what we had was 936 weeks. Now we have 364 weeks. And over that course of middle school, puberty hits. 
Middle school sports hits. My son's trying out for his first team tomorrow. The first girlfriend or boyfriend, even though they don't know what that means. The first viewing of pornography. The first F on a report card. All that happens. The first middle school dance happens. You blink, and then the next thing you know, they're going to MAPS orientation or ACE orientation or IB orientation. They're, they're going to something because they've hit high school. And then the next thing you know, you've got, you, you have AP tests, you have AP exams, you have driver's edge, you have prom, you have JV, you have varsity. And eventually you see the look in some of their eyes when they realize they've worked their whole life to go to a certain school or to get a soccer scholarship or a football scholarship and the coaches tell them no. And you just see the life drain out of them because they know it's coming to an end. You see the mamas and the dads cry on senior nights. You see the, 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 the end of year banquets. And every week, every week from the time they're born to the time they graduate and leave the house, you, you're pulling a marble out. And every week, these marbles represent a week. Every week you pull a marble out. And once that marble is out of the jar, you can't ever put it back in. And we have to ask ourselves, how are we using our time as parents and grandparents investing not only in the next generation because they are the next generation, but they're also the current generation. Like one thing I don't like when I hear it is the youth or the, the church of the future. No, they're the church of today. And we've got to invest in them today. And every, we only have one shot to get it right. There's no redos. There's no, like when I was growing up on the, uh, the original Nintendo and the original PlayStation, if you didn't like what happened, you would go up, hit the reset button, and start the game over again. Anybody do that? Come on, if you didn't, you're lying. Yeah, and uh, everybody did that. You had resets. You had redos. In golf, you get mulligans. In life, you don't get that. With kids, you don't get that. So the next three weeks, what I hope to do is kind of walk through um, each transition and kind of give some points that I've learned and some things that I've observed over being in student ministry for 23 years. And I don't know everything. I don't know a lot. But I have learned a couple of things over the years. And I can help you make those transitions based on what I have seen based on um, what Carrie has seen. She, before we moved here, she was a children's minister at our last church, and she has a seminary degree as well. And uh, so, what, and, and then I've talked with Bridget, I've talked with Alex, who, by the way, Bridget's a rock star. And if your kid is in this children's ministry, you, I hope you understand how blessed you are. Um, a lot of what we're able to do at the rec is because of the excellence that Bridget does day in and day out in the children's ministry, just to be straight up. And uh, so tonight what I want to look at is an overview, okay? Next week we're going to look at 6th grade. The third week we're going to look at ninth and 12th grade because there's a lot of similarities there. But tonight what I want to do is give you an overview, a biblical foundation, and I want to talk to you about what you can do at home and what we do here at, at Emerald Coast Fellowship to help you navigate these uncertain times, right? Because let's face it. I'm in student ministry. Every year for 23 years, I've told parents, your sixth grader is going to be okay. Well, now I have a sixth grader. <laughs> and I'm about to find out if everything I've said in the last 23 years is worth the air I've wasted on it, right? And I'll be honest, I wasn't that nervous. But maybe, maybe that was just the confidence I have in what we do here at Emerald Coast and the, the people we surrounded, because it's not going to be me if he gets out of this successfully. It's going to be all the people we have around him. But I wasn't nervous, and we're about to find out if that was a good thing or a bad thing. But what I'm going to tell you over the next few weeks, some of it you may like, some of it you may not like, but it's the best that I can do to help you navigate these times. So I've got a... Um, now that we've done that illustration, I've got another one for you. On the screen behind me is a picture of a baby dedication that we did just a couple of weeks ago. And beside it is a graduation picture set at Tommy Oliver Stadium at the end of May this year. The picture on your left, this is really cool. The picture on your left has Alex Gentile and Hannah Gentile at the middle of that. Well, when I got here, Hannah Gentile was a senior in high school. 
And I remember going to Crestview to watch her play a playoff soccer game. The Dolphins played, uh, I think it's the, whatever Crestview is, the Bulldogs or something like that. But we, we went there because that was the only chance that we were going to get to watch her play high school soccer if she got beat. They won the game and they went on. But Alex was in ninth grade when I got here. He was in ninth grade. He had a buzz cut. He was obsessed with playing first base. That was him. And he was, and everybody loved him. Immediately, I saw, we saw the leadership potential in Alex. And over the next four years, he grew and uh, entered ministry. And I still have a picture of the very first small group that he led as an early high schooler sitting in the, what was, uh, the destroyed small group rooms across the street that we used to use. Now, I blinked. I've been here almost 11 years. That kid is now a full-grown pastor, and he's dedicating his son, or excuse me, he's, ded- yeah, he's dedicating his son, having already dedicated his daughter. So he grew up in the church, works in the church, is invested in the church. Hannah's invested in the church. She's, she dedicated her newborn son, Henry, um, a couple of weeks ago. To the right is, was Brandy Sheffield. She's married now. Brandy Sheffield was in seventh grade when I got here. Seventh grade. She went on to get married to a, a young man who's f- phenomenal. We love him. He played football. Um, I'm the chaplain for Mosley's football team. He played football for us at Mosley. Now they are establishing their own family and they are dedicating their son Wesley to, or they dedicated their son Wesley two weeks ago. Right? They were young and then I blinked and now they're full grown adults. Not only being positive, uh, doing a positive impact in the community, but making a difference in this church and in the kingdom of God. Right, the, the family next to them is in the process of doing that. They're, they're fully in, bought in. The Briggs, they're, they're bought in. They're doing everything they need to do to raise their kids to, to be followers of Jesus Christ, and they dedicated theirs that same day. So that's three, two families that kind of grew up here, another family that joined, and all three of them are, 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 are doing their best to try and raise disciples of Jesus, and if they keep going down the track they're going, they're going to knock it out of the park. They're going to do great. That picture to the to my to your right is the Matt Steven, or uh, is Ryan Stevenson graduating high school last May. The reason I showed that is Ryan's family joined the church the same day that Carrie and I were presented to the church in December of, of 2010. Same day. I watched that kid grow up. I blinked and he became a high caliber high school football player and a great guy. Matt was in the youth group. He interned for me last year, and now he's an adult, and he's probably about to walk on stage right now and do announcements with a room full of middle schoolers, and that place was a beehive when I walked over here. There's no telling how many are over there. But um, but what I'm telling you is in a blink, that baby dedication becomes a high school graduation picture. And the phrase that I've heard my whole life, I'm finding to be true. The days are long, but the years are short. You ever heard that? And I, I, I looked at my five-year-old who went to kindergarten, and I went, my goodness, where did the time go? I would do it all over again. It was so much fun. But, the, but now we're in a new phase. And some of you people are in, in a new phase. So as we enter this new phase... Um, Whether you're going into middle school, elementary, not so much elementary, but whether you're going into middle school, high school, or young adulthood, here's a handful of things. There's four things, five things that you need to know off the top before we get into Scripture, okay? And the first thing is that everything breaks in their world. What does that mean, okay? Let's talk about this for a second. Puberty hits, right? Right? Puberty hits. Middle school boys become stinky middle school boys who need deodorant, okay, who don't like showers. But puberty hits. Their body's going through all these changes, and it's like in their minds, they're kind of messed up. Everything's messed up. Girls start going through changes, and they don't know how to handle it, and they feel awkward. And it's just, it's just, uh, especially for the early bloomers, you know, it's like some of these seventh and eighth graders went back to school um, at UA and North Bay or wherever you go, and, and they looked at some girls and went, whoa, you look different. Because puberty hit in over summer. And, 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 they're, they're, and when puberty hits in, it starts changing the chemicals and it, change, it changes their behavior because they don't know what they're feeling. They don't know what they're comprehending. Some of you grandparents are like, mine's an adult and he still doesn't know what he's thinking, right? I've, I've got a nod over here. But anyway, so, but, but things are happening. 
Awkward things are happening. And that leads to awkward conversations. And by the way, if you wait till middle school to have some of those awkward conversations, you've already waited too long because they find out about most of that stuff in about third grade, maybe fourth grade. But then you've got the emotional highs and lows that come with, with puberty that messes with their, their, their minds. It's like one moment a girl, a, teen, a middle school girl, has fr they're friends with everybody. The next moment they can't get along with themselves. The next moment they're friends with everybody. How do I know this? It's because I got middle school girls in a lead up to summer camp from March, April, and May will text me about 15 different roommate requests. Every week I get the new request. It's whoever she's getting along with that week. The next week it changes, Right? And Carrie and I are convinced, like, that, like the meanness comes out, that, and I'm going to boys here in a second, but the meanness in middle school girls comes out because they're, they're, they're trying to figure out how to do this thing, this adolescent thing. And deep down, we all have this fear of rejection, and a lot of the meanness isn't so much, I'm just trying to be mean to you, but I mean, Carrie and I are convinced after talking and dealing with drama for years, is that a lot of times there is meanness, don't get me wrong. Sometimes they get it from mama, but a lot of times, but a lot of times you got a teenage girl that just literally doesn't want to be left out and rejected. So she's going to do whatever she's got to do to stay in the group. And if that means pushing somebody else out, she's not trying to be mean. It's like a, it's like a self-preservation and, and, and they don't, they're trying to be nice, but at the same time, they've got all this going on in their head and in their body with emotions and chemical changes and, and everything else, it's, it's hard. It's hard. I couldn't imagine being a teenager with social media. I mean, think about you. Think about all the dumb stuff we all used to do. Right? And think, think of all that. We lived in a, in, where, in, in a social media world where literally everything stays on the Internet forever. Every text message, once you send it, you lose control of it. Right? Uh, could you imagine? And they're, they're having to navigate all this. So boys are going, doing the same thing. All the chemicals are going on. They're trying to figure out deodorant, brushing their teeth, brushing their hair. They're trying to figure out. It's like re-teaching re a three-year-old, right, sometimes. But, and, and I hear parents sometimes go, well, they just turn their brain off when they turn about 13. Well, I don't think they turn their brain off. It's just I think it's moving so fast they can't just think clearly sometimes. right? And I've got a picture next week that you're going to love. But a story real quick is a couple of years ago at summer camp, I had a middle, school, a, a middle school boy take his shoes off on the rec field. Now, this is June in Alabama on concrete. Take his, his shoes off and socks off on the rec field, walk a quarter mile to the cafeteria, eat lunch, and then tell me, Pastor Doug, I don't have shoes. And I look down, and sure enough, he's barefoot. And I'm like, son, how did you make it a quarter mile over hot asphalt in June in southern Alabama and not realize you had no shoes on? He's like, I, I didn't think about it. Got more next to a turtle. Apparently a turtle ate a pair of shoes off a kayak a couple years ago at camp. You'll learn about that next week. But uh, there, there wasn't a turtle. He just dropped his shoes. But anyway, it, it's like they have these moments because everything feels like it's breaking inside and they don't know what to do with it. That's why they have the emotional outburst and then two minutes later they're your best kid again. It's like there's so much going on. Their ethics, their ethics are being challenged like anything, like nothing they've ever encountered before. They're exposed to pornographic images. They're exposed to dating. They're exposed to people cheating on tests. They're exposed to the meanness that comes with middle school. They encounter the popularity tests in high school of homecoming court of SGA elections, of prom. I mean, they, 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 they have, um, they, they're trying out for teams for the first time. Some of them are facing getting cut from something for the first time. You know, uh, it's like friendships change. People that they grew up with from the womb almost because their parents were friends and they got along with each other. Now they hit middle school and one goes the video game route and one goes the athletic route and they no longer have anything in common. Both are just as good as the other, but they have nothing in common. And they begin to see friendships break. And, and sometimes they circle back around and sometimes they don't. But you're seeing like relationship changes, friendship groups change over activities, over ethics, over different stuff. It's like as, as these teenagers are now becoming their own person and they're, and they're beginning to make their own decisions. So things break. Parent-child relationship changes. Your teenager wants more independence that you're not ready to give them. It's a hard thing for parents to learn. They can't control everything. That's hard. 
But it's something we have to learn so we can empower them to make their own decisions that will help them be a fully functioning adult. The interests change. We already hit on that some. Kids that play sports don't want to play sports anymore. Kids that like doing one activity don't want to do that. They pick up something else. Music changes. You start seeing music you've never heard in your room or in your, coming out of your kid's room. You start seeing like, I didn't know you were into science fiction. Well, they may be into science fiction for a week. Or all of a sudden, they become a fan of a team you've never cheered for before. Well, they'll trade that guy. They'll trade whoever player it is they like, and they'll go root for somebody else. I mean, it's all over the place. Interests change. Loyalties change. But here's the thing. That phase you're in right now will end. And you can never have it back. So we have to ask ourselves, no matter what phase we're in, no matter what's going on, have I taken advantage of the days that, the God, that God has given me with this child? We have to realize that they are not just our child. They are a child of God that we have been blessed with and entrusted to train up in the ways of God so that we can set them free to make an impact in the world and that they would raise their own children by the standards of God. So you're not raising children, you're raising future adults who God has specifically designed, Psalm 139, to do works that he has prepared in advance for us to do, Ephesians 2.10. That's the goal. So now that we have kind of done this introduction, if we're going to be successful, we got to know in raising kids, we got to know what the end, what is the end goal? Right? As a, as a coach, as, as I always want to know, what is the point of what we're doing? What is the end goal? What, it, what is the outcome that I want out of this? Well, the outcome that we want as Christian parents is the goal is to have a fully functioning adult who loves Christ. That's it. That's it. We want to, dis- we want to make a disciple who in turn makes disciples. And, and in the Old Testament, there is a story of a young man who went from being a teenager to being an adult in an incredibly difficult situation named Daniel. And Daniel's going to be somebody we keep going back to in this, this three weeks. All right, so we're going to be, if you've got a Bible and it'll be on the screen behind me, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8 is where we're going to pick up. But let me set this up. So the nation of Israel was always told... And uh, the Jewish people were told, if you love God, God will, God will bless you. If you obey him, God will, will bless you, right? If you don't, then, then you will be cursed and there will be punishment for that. It's kind of the agreement uh, in, in, the, in the Old Testament. Well, the nation at this point had disobeyed God. They had followed pagan religions. They had done everything that God told them not to do. So finally, God gave them chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. And finally, he allowed the Babylonians to come down out of the north and to conquer the, the, the Jewish people. And after destroying the Jewish land, uh, the, the, king of, the, the king of Babylon took the best and brightest that the, that the Jewish people had to offer, and he took them to Babylon to basically put in a re-education camp to train the Jewishness out of them and the Babylonian into them, and then they would go to work for his empire, empire to help expand the influence of the Babylonians across the world. So this is a highly edu- high academic setting that they were in. And Daniel and his Daniel had to make a, a decision. Does he honor God when everything in culture is telling him not to? Or does he take the easy way out, the culturally easy way out, that benefits him the quickest in the short term and maybe the long term? Because he knew taking a stand for God could have impacted him negatively in his studies. See, Daniel was in a nice place. If you had to be a captive, if you had to be kidnapped and moved 2,000 miles from home, Daniel was in a pretty good place. He could have been in a dungeon. He could have been a slave. He was a, he was a servant in the royal house who was being trained up to be a, an, a, an authority figure in the kingdom and to do the work of the, of, of the king. So we, now we get to, to chapter 1, verse 8, where Daniel is told to eat certain food. And in verse 8, the the Bible says, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. Yet he said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has signed your food and drink. What if he sees your face is looking thinner than the other young men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. He's like, hey, man, I really want to let you honor your God. I do. I like you. You're a good good guy, Daniel. 
But if I do what you're asking me to do and it doesn't work out, the king might execute me because I'm responsible for you. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel and his friends, Please test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. He agreed with them about this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Verse 17, God gave these four men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. At the end of the time, the king had said to present the, the at the end of the time that the king had said to present them, the chief eunuch presented them. The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel and his friends. So they began to attend the king. They worked, they worked for the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians, mediums, and other officials in his kingdom. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. So what we see here is Daniel had, an offer, he had a choice to make. Do I honor God or do I take the easy way out? Daniel t said, I'm going to honor God. I'm going to have a spine of steel and I'm going to have spiritual fortitude and I'm going to do what God has called me to do. But I'm not going to be arrogant. I'm not going to be disobedient about it. I'm going to be wise about it. And Daniel took a religious principle that he believed in, and then he figured out how to apply that in a way that it would work, right? You follow me? So, so he, had, he, he came up with this plan for him to be able to honor God and be able to make a difference in the kingdom that he was now a citizen in. And it worked. God blessed it. And Daniel rose in prominence. And we know that over his life, Daniel faced multiple times, even as an old man, to where he had to make a decision. And every time, he chose God. That's the end goal. We want to raise modern-day Daniels in a modern-day Babylon where culture is throwing everything that's anti-biblical at our kids. They're throwing whatever the hot thing is at the day. They're supposed to cheer for the thing of the day. They're supposed to be mad for whatever that thing of the day is on Twitter that everybody's supposed to be mad about. A culture's throwing them, like, live in the moment. Don't worry about tomorrow. Everything culture throws at them is so much more intense than anything that any adult had when we were in middle school. And then throw social media on there, and it's even more. So we want to raise modern-day Daniels in a modern-day Babylon who live for Jesus and eventually become mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, employees and employers who live for God in everything they do. So for us to do that, it starts at home with mom and dad. And that's why we're coming up with these transition plans because we want to help you take advantage of a, of a time that has a heightened sense of stress and anxiety for a lot of you guys. For me, it does, right? I remember the first, when Weston went to kindergarten, he's now in sixth grade. When Weston went to kindergarten, I probably need to go back and apologize to everybody that works here because I was probably a ball of misery for about a month. I was like, my little buddy's gone. I, my life is ending because Weston's going to kindergarten. You know what? It was fine. He loved it. After day one, he wouldn't even let us walk him in. Today, Dylan... Walked in with his brothers, day two. He didn't want nothing to do with us. He wouldn't even tell us how day one went. He was like, it's fine. I'm ready to go back. He wouldn't even talk to us. So it's like, so if any of y'all know my son Dylan, if you can find out how school went today, please tell me because he won't talk to me. Um, but, but the goal is to have a functioning adult. And to do that, it starts in the home. So there's this component of the church and the, and the family working together. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about. To, to drill this in on how important and that you are in the life of your child, I want to read back in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, and that's going to be behind me. Moses said to the nation of Israel, he said, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. Deuteronomy 6, 
Okay, and 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 to re- to, so what we see here, Moses is addressing families, but he's also addressing the entirety, the entire nation of Israel here. Okay, and in this, I want to read you something that I wrote in my project proposal. I'm just going to read it straight out of the paper and, and to kind of send it home real briefly so I don't, ra- so I don't chase rabbits on this because I, I'll, I'll go all day on this if you let me. But here's, here's, a, here's something I wrote about the importance of, the, of parents in the life of a child. It's, I said this, God commands a man and a woman to leave their parents and create a new family unit to continue the family structure and populate the earth. In ordaining the family, God gave responsibility to parents for teaching children the ways of God. In Deuteronomy 6, God gives parents the command to instill a healthy understanding of Him in their children. Professor Richard Ross, who is a professor at Southwestern Seminary, and he's probably close to 90 and he's still going, still going strong, says, Since the time of Moses, faithful Jews have quoted the words of Deuteronomy 6 each morning and evening. He continues to to write, Dr. Ross does, that no other passage of the Old Old Testament carries the weight and regard of Deuteronomy 6. In this passage, God commands the Israelites to love Him and then immediately calls on parents to pass this love of God into their children. This passage puts parents in the primary position of growing disciples of Christ. Martin Luther, the great reformer, argued that the purpose of marriage is to produce godly children. Luther believed that the family was the preeminent state of life and preceded the fall of man into sin. He's talking about Adam and Eve. Luther believed that parenting was a holy vocation commissioned by God Almighty. The command in Deuteronomy 6 is not given to just some vague group of people, but to a a specific set of parents for children. That means you're responsible. I'm responsible for raising our children and my child. God did not give this position of of first place to the church or the student ministry of a church. Instead, God directed parents to educate their children in the ways of God as they went about everyday life. The idea of parents having the primary responsibility of discipling children is biblical, it's backed up by Scripture, and it's backed up by secular research. Christian Smith and Melinda Lundquist did a study about 15, 20 years ago that is kind of a, a, a trendsetter with academic research in the areas of youth ministry. And they talked about the single most influential person in a teenager's spiritual life are who? Parents. Parents. Some of you are in a place right now to where you feel like now that you've got a teenager, you don't matter as much as you used to. Some of you feel like your friends, your coaches, your, 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 the, the, your kids' friends, their coaches, that culture maybe has more impact on your child than you do. And I want to tell you and affirm you that God specifically gave you your child and you have more influence in that child's life than anyone else on the face of the planet. You may not think you do, but you do. It's backed up biblically, and it's backed up by secular research. A guy named um, Merton Stronum writes that a child's friends may strongly influence a child or a teenager, but they are of less of an influence than parents. Get this. He writes through his research with the Georgia Baptist Convention. Parents only lose their primary influence when they disengage and their relationship with their teenager diminishes. Listen, let me tell you right now. For better or worse, you have more influence than anyone else or anything else in the life of your child. And with that weighty responsibility, that weighty position, our words and our actions have the ability to have more positive influence and launch a child into life, or more to hurt that and hinder a child's launch into life. So the responsibility that we have is important, and it's God-given. It's not given by the state. It's not given by the Constitution. It's not given by by, by, by the school district. It is given by God Himself for you to use to raise children to the best of your ability to love Jesus. And when that goes sideways, we also see the negative sides of that when parents don't do their jobs. 
You know, I, 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 did, I worked with a high school football coach one time that used to say almost every problem with a child is not a child problem, it's an adult problem. A lot of the issues we have in Bay County that our church has poured efforts and effort and effort into over the years and that other churches have done is to fix those problems that occur when adults don't act like adults, when parents don't act like parents. But some of the best kids to ever come through that student ministry have a parents who have poured into them and loved them and, and have launched them into adulthood. I always say you got to have two things to do student ministry. Neither one of them has to do with the student pastor. It has to do with a senior pastor that gets it and is willing to invest so much into a children's and student ministries, and Dr. Steve gets it. He used to do what I do at the rec. He gets it. And that's why we invest so much energy into student ministry and into children's ministry. Aaron Lovett gets it. Our elders get it. Monty gets it. That's why that's the first thing you gotta have. The second thing you gotta have are solid families who will bend over backwards to get your, their kids to your stuff at church because they know the value of instilling Christ like ethics in them. They understand the value of salvation and sanctification in the life of a child. So you as a mom and dad have more power and more influence than you think you have. Grandparents, you're right there. But grandparents don't even overtake the parents until the parents are out of the picture. So use that wisely. What we see in Judges, and I have these verses, Julie, we're not going to get into these for time. But in Judges chapter 2, we see when parents don't use that influence well. In Judges chapter 2, what we see is right after God has taken the Israelites out of Egypt through the Exodus, they, they, He's taken over the, the promised land, He's given them the promised land. Within a generation, the nation had walked away from God. All it took for a nation to turn its back was one generation of parents not instilling the faith of their fathers in their children. So what we have, the responsibility we have is so important. But if we use it right, right, if we use it right and we love our kids and we instill Jesus in them, everything shows that the, it works. Now, it's not a 100% promise. That, promise in, uh, that, that, that passage in Proverbs where it says, raise up a child in the way they should go. There's plenty of Christian parents who have done everything right and their child still walked away from the faith. That's going to happen. I'm sorry to say it, but it's going to happen. But if you do, if you instill godliness into your children because they see it in you, I believe that God honors that. And I see it from time after time after time. That, I show, that, that picture I showed you of, of Matt and Ryan Stevenson is because Matt is an, Matt interned for me, not because I was an exceptional youth pastor. He interned for me because his parents instilled Jesus in him. And then when he became an adult, he wanted to instill Jesus in those middle school dudes that he would hang out with on campus until he had to go get a big boy job. And because he's still over there pouring into those kids, those kids know who he is. And that's because he's got parents and grandparents that, that pushed him that way. Alex Gentili is who Alex Gentili is today because he's got parents and grandparents who have loved him and poured Jesus into him. I got a high school senior leading my praise band right now. He's growing in his walk with Jesus because his parents have instilled Jesus in him. You know, we've got six high school interns working at the church this year. They're, not, they're doing work study. They're doing work study. We've got six spread out between me, Jennifer, Alex, and Bridget. And all these kids are growing in their faith right now as high school students because they've got parents who are pouring Jesus into them. Are you following me? So don't ever think that you cannot have the influence that the Bible says you ought to have. So how does this look at Emerald Coast Fellowship? I told you there's two parts of it, right? The church part and the home part. How does this work? Many times, the church and the family are running on parallel parts, okay? You've got, they're running for the same goal, but they're doing it par on parallel tracks, and they never cross, they never touch, 
they just go. Mom and dad are doing their thing, and then they, they come to church. The church is doing its thing, but never really sending material home and, and, and helping parents at home. It's just everybody's just kind of doing their thing. You got the church here, you got families here, and you're running parallel tracks toward the same goal. But biblically, and the research shows that if you can take the church and the home and combine those two influences into one greater influence, you can have a bigger impact. And we're working hard to do that here. Like behind the scenes, some of the structures that Dr. Steve talks about in the systems are to help us better get things into your hands as mom and dad so you know what we talked about in small groups, so you know what we talked about on Wednesday nights, so we can get resources into your hands, so we can partner with you better. We feel like we do a pretty good job, but so we can do it better. And so what you've got is this whole philosophy called orange that came up, a guy named Reggie Joyner came up with. And what he did is he took the home and the church, he made the church red, and the, or excuse me, the home red and the church yellow. And he said, if you combine those two colors, those two influences into one, you get a new color. And just so happens it's Tennessee orange. I love it. Greatest thing ever. Go Vols. And, uh, but uh, but, but it's, te- it's orange. And, and his whole philosophy of, of, of family ministry is this combining the influences so you have a greater influence. I love this. And it's what we try to do here. We don't say the word orange a lot because nobody knows what we're talking about. The term I use a lot is we want to be the third. The wreck wants to be the third adult in your, in your child's life. You need mom and dad, and we want to be that third adult that is there that, you, that, that, that they'll come talk to, right? It's like we want to be that place that's a safe place to where your, your teenager goes, I don't want to talk to you, but I'll talk to somebody there. Does that make sense? And we don't want to do it to pull your kid away from you. We want to do it because when they come and talk to us, guess what we tell them to do? Hey, I'm going to talk to you, but really what you need to go is you need to go see mom. You need to go talk to dad. You're struggling with what you're looking at on the, on, the, on the internet, on Safari, on your phone. You don't need to come talk to me about it. You need to go sit down with mom and dad and have an honest conversation and say that you're struggling and you need them to help you protect your phone. Oh my gosh, I can't talk to my parents about that. Your parents will love you if you come talk to them about that. I promise you they will. So we drive them back. That's what that third adult is. That's one way we work with, with parents. So we want to combine that in that whole orange thing so that we can combine influences to help you. Because the Deuteronomy 6 not only talks about the family, but don't forget, he's talking, Moses is talking to the entire nation of Israel. And the entire nation of Israel is made up of what? Twelve tribes with all kinds of families inside those tribes. I mean, there were other people pouring in to these kids in ancient, ancient Israel more than just the parents. The parents had the primary spot, but there were other influences. And it's the same way with the church. We don't have that place, of, of that first primary place, but we can come alongside and we can come alongside you and help you push your child into godliness and then launch them into adults one day. And so how do we do this here? I get that I went long on that, but sorry. So how do we do this here? We do this through our next step funnel. I mean, some of y'all are cringing right now because you're tired of hearing about next steps. But it works. It works. We have five next steps here. And we'll sh- in a minute, you'll see why I'm telling you this. We have five next steps. We have salvation. We want to make sure that people hear the gospel and that people get saved. The next step is baptism. We want to make sure that you make a public profession of your faith in Christ. The third step we have here is small groups. We want you in a small group so that you can do life with people who are like-minded to help you and encourage you through the good days and the bad days. The fourth thing we want is we want you to serve. We need you to serve. Right now, our children's and youth ministries are, are growing so quick that we, we constantly need more volunteers. It's like, well, I can't teach. Okay, you can, take a, you can lead a line down the hallway for Bridget, right? But we need more volunteers. The next, uh, serving, the next one, I lost my train of thought there. The next one is sharing. We want you to be able to share your faith with your neighbors when you're sitting in the stands at a ball game and somebody says, hey, tell me about that, shirt, that, that, that rec shirt you're wearing or that church shirt you're wearing. You sit there and tell them, well, we go to church because we believe in Jesus. That's what we want. And it just so happens that in this, I started, in my doctoral work, I started doing research on practices that keep kids in church. 
And what I found is five common practices that churches use to keep kids in church when they do them right. All five fit into our next steps. So what do we do as a church to help come along with you? We want you moving down the next step funnel so you continually grow in your walk with Jesus. There are five things that a church can do to, that, that will help keep a kid in church once they graduate high school so they don't graduate church. The first is that they need to, be, they need to have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's one of our next steps. If a, if a kid's going to walk with Jesus, the kid's got to be saved and realize that they are a sinner in need of Christ's salvation. Secondly, churches that, have, um, that encourage positive relationships with godly parents between teenagers and parents tend to see p kids stick in church. That's why we, like the, the Ramoses, do a marriage class from time to time. That's why we talk about marriage so much and loving your spouse. It's because if you love your spouse and you and your spouse have a good relationship, then you're probably going to have a pretty good relationship with your kid because your home is a loving house, right? And when we say having a relation, when we tell parents to have a relationship with their kids, find out what your kid likes and invest yourself into it. Well, Doug, I don't like video games. Well, how much do you like your kid? Right? Doug, I don't like to fish. Yeah, but Johnny likes to fish. Go buy a boat. I'm trying to help you out, Dad. <laughs> you know, if they golf, take golfing lessons. Well, I, I, don't like, I, don't, I, don't like, I don't like cards. Go play cards. Make yourself like it. It's not about the activity. It's about having a relationship with your kid and deepening that bond. The third thing that churches do that works real well, and we've always hammered this one, is multi-generational relationships in the church. One thing that I love right now is the number of teenagers that serve on this stage on Sunday morning. Have y'all noticed that? Pay attention. How many current rec and former rec kids are on this stage on Sunday morning? Right? That's not because we're doing anything awesome. It's because they want to serve. They want to serve, and, and they're, when they're on the stage, they're interacting with older people. We've got people in the back running sound and lights that are young. We have kids up in Video World, which is in behind that glass wall up there, and um, um, working cameras. I've got a kid at the rec right now that is that, it, that he set up a brand new live stream system. I have no idea how he did it, but if you go to the rec's Facebook page, if it works like it's supposed to work, not only will you get the lyrics on the bottom of the screen like we do on Sunday mornings, but you get a rec logo in the corner. I don't know how he did it. I don't care how he did it. He did it, right? But he's serving. So, but he's serving with older people over here. We have teenagers that serve in the greeter ministry with Charlie and Gloria, uh, with Charlie Rutledge out front and work with Jennifer. We actually have a couple of teenage girls who serve in the kids' ministry on Wednesday nights from 6 to 7 and then go over to the high school service at 7.15. Why do I say this? It's because every time we have a kid serve around an adult, they build a relationship with an adult that's older than them, wiser than them, and more experienced than them. You don't think those teenagers, the smart ones, are watching? I know a lot of them are. So we've got that multi-generational relationships where that, and, and research shows that's one of the most important things a church can do to keep kids in church after they graduate. The church must pri prioritize young people. We all know that. When the, 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 we do that here. When the, when the pandemic hit, the pastor shut down Wednesday nights and moved the wreck in here, and we built this crazy-looking pole barn with a food truck out underneath it. It's like, I don't get any more Northwest Florida than that. You know, I mean, we're, this, you're my people. You know, we, we got a food truck, and we're about to baptize a seventh grade girl out in a parking lot next to 390 in a horse trough underneath a pole barn. You know, it's like, it's awesome. But, but it's a priority. And then the church must teach a missionary mindset. Like, like at the rec, we talk about who's your one. Who's the one person that you're going to pray for, share your faith with, and invite, invite to church? We, we talk about this. This past week, we challenged the FCA at North Bay Haven. They got 900 kids in that school. A freshman in high school should never graduate four years later without having someone from FCA share the gospel one-on-one -on -one with them. That's what we challenged them with this week. You got to teach that missionary mindset that they're not at school just to get grades. They're at school to be a missionary for Jesus Christ, right? So that's what we're doing with the, as, a, as a church to help you out. And all of those fit into our next steps and are backed up by research. So next, what, what does your team need from you at home? Are you all still with me? Are you following me? Am I making sense here? I feel like I'm gurgitating information right here, and I don't know if it's sticking or not. But, uh, but what do you need to do at home? You know, we talk about the church and the home working together, right? So what you need to do at home, your kid really needs four things from you at the house. They need you to love God. 
If Jesus is overflowing from your heart because you have such an intimate relationship with him, it will flow into your kids' lives. It will flow into your employees' lives. It will flow into your kids' friends' lives because they're going to hang out in your house while they eat your food and destroy your retirement savings, right? You've got to love them. In a world that will use a kid for as long as they're useful and then discard them, in a world that wants to tell everything that's wrong about them, that tells them to change what they believe, to change who they are, that who they are is not good enough, they need to know that you love them. Whether they succeed or whether they fail, whether they do right or whether they mess up, do you love them? They want to know that they're loved. And I'm going to be honest with you. If you go over to our welcome desk over there, we tell our volunteers, you better be smiling at that welcome desk. Why? Because some of those kids, that's the first smiling face they see all day on Wednesdays. So mom and dad, if you can show them that you love them and make them believe that you love them, you're already way above the curve. If, you're loving, if you love God, you're way above the curve. They need boundaries. Nobody likes rules. I don't like rules. When we go to summer camp, we take 12 student life rules and turn them into four. And the first one sums them all up. Anybody know what it is? I heard it. Don't be stupid. That's my number one rule at summer camp. If Doug would say this is stupid, don't do it. Right? The rest of them, I mean, it's just, I don't like rules. When I, and, and, and I don't like enforcing them. But that's what I have to do. So I try to have rules that encompass things that are easy to enforce. But in your house, your teenager wants boundaries. They need boundaries to exist in. Because a, a society without rules is chaos. In fact, listen to this. A relationship without boundaries leads to chaos. Rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Did you hear that? They want boundaries. They need boundaries. They push it, but they need it. And they, the boundaries come from your love for God, your love for them, and being able to set, the, like bowling, the bumpers out and say, this is what you've got to stay, stay within. And when you get outside this, this bumper, these are the consequences. But you better enforce them, right? You better enforce them. The last thing they need, and this kind of sounds like the second one, but bear with me. They need you to accept and believe in them. No matter what. We live in a world to where there's all kinds of academic pressures on these kids. You don't understand the academic pressure that are on these schools, okay? It's not just the kids. It's the teachers. It's the principals. There's a lot of pressure on them to perform. Coaches, there's a lot of uh, pressure on them, on them to perform. If you don't win now, they'll fight. you're done. You're done. There's a lot of pressure, and it flows downhill, and it lands on the kids. They need to know that whether they ace that exam or not, that when they come home, you're going to love them, and you're going to accept them. Does that make sense? If, they, if you get the phone call from the authorities or from the school that they've done the worst thing that you hope they never do, will, you may be mad at them, you may want to kill them, but will you love them and will you accept them at the end of the day? They need to know that because they live in a world that will accept them until it becomes inconvenient and then they will discard them. Because that's the world we live in. As an employee, you are only as good, you are only good to your employer until you're not. That's life, right? We live in a world to where we get rejected a lot. Right now, the hopes and dreams of a lot of high school seniors are about to get crushed. Because I'm with a high school football program, and there's a lot of guys that have been working for athletic scholarships their entire lives. Well, sometime in the next six to eight weeks, a lot of those guys are going to be told they're not going to get that scholarship. And that life is going to drain out of them. It's going to drain out of mom and dad, too. At some point, there's going to be some people that their entire life they thought they were going to go to a certain college and they're going to get the rejection letter and have to face their family when everybody's going to that college, they can't go to it. It's a real thing. 
when they, when that, if that bad news comes, they need to know that you still believe in them, you still love them, and you still accept them. And when they know they can trust you, they'll do anything for you. So the opportunity you have is incredible. Don't think for a moment that you're losing that because they're reaching adolescence. So next week, we're going to talk about the transition into sixth grade, and there's a lot to that, okay? We're going to laugh a little bit. We're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about Daniel some more. Then then two weeks from now, we're going to talk about ninth grade, and we're going to talk about twelfth grade. And tonight, I wanted to reinforce to you that you are created by God to raise your kids, and you can do it. And if there's anything that this church can do that I can do to come alongside you, I'm just a phone call away. I'm just a phone call away. I would love to partner with you. Right now, we're getting ready to walk. I'm getting ready to walk across there. You're more than welcome to come. And I'm going to go baptize a girl who got saved at summer camp. So if you want to know if the, if the investment this church makes into student ministry makes a difference, we had 26 kids saved in one month. One month. I'm telling you, there is a revival breaking out in America that nobody's talking about. It's happening. God is on the move. And we're doing everything we can to catch what he's doing and jump on board with it. So here's the thing. I want to pray for you real quick. And then um, I need to talk to you about, about our counselors in the back. And I got some resources for you, okay? But let me pray and then we'll get out of here. God, we love you and we thank you. I, I pray for these families as they start a new school year. I pray for the teachers. There's multiple teachers, a principal in the room. I pray for them as they guide these young hearts and these young minds. And it is such a blessing for a guy like me to be able to come alongside Bay District Schools in a charter system here. The, the, the ability that youth guys have in this county to partner with schools doesn't exist everywhere, God, and I thank you for that. I thank you for the relationships this church has built with the schools and with other government agencies that allow us to, to, to help people make an impact on this generation. And God, I just, but right now, I pray even more for the mama who's, who's, who's just uncertain and scared about the transition her kid's going through. I pray for the dad who, who's emotional inside but too afraid to show it on the outside, kind of like I've been at times. But, uh, but I just lift up these parents that you would grow them and refine them so that they can pour into their kids and produce children who love you. In your name we pray. Amen. A couple of things, a couple of resources for you, okay? Cami Smith and Allie Taylor in the back. Yes, that is Allie Taylor, the daughter of Steve Taylor, and uh, who has graduated from the University of Mobile with multiple degrees. But Cami and Allie, along with Joni Bird, make up our counseling team here at the church. has been widely successful. And you never hear anything about it because that's on design. We can't talk about it. But they have been widely successful um, helping people through a lot of stuff. Cammie is primarily counseling adolescents and adults. Allie is focusing on five-year-olds to 18-year-olds. And um, they've both um, experienced some pretty tough situations and helped families walk through them. Um, so if you need, if, if, if you're overwhelmed by anything in life, transition-wise or anything else, they're a great resource. They have a page in the back that has all their information on it, and I think they have business cards. We also have the church has provided some resources for parents. We are working on a resource page on the website to where we can get you resources with Amazon links and everything else, but that is not, it's still in, in construction. So in the back is a sheet with some, um, some books on it that might help you through the journey. I've got a couple of them up here. I can't give these out because I have to use these for my final uh, project exit interview here in a couple of months. I have to study these really hard. And, uh, but, but this one is uh, Faith for Exiles by David Kinneman, and it talks about how to raise godly, godly adults in a, in a modern-day Babylon. And then these two come out of a resource that I'm a big fan of called Just a Phase. You can go to justaphase.com, and what they do is from birth until young adulthood, they have one of these books for every single year or grade that your kid will go through. So there's like 18, and then there's a young adult book. 
And uh, you can go on, and these give you kind of an overview of what's going on inside and kind of the world that they're facing. But if there's a resource um, that we can get you, let me know. Um, like I said, i got to go baptize a kid, and I'm late. So, um, But we love you guys. Thank you for being here. If you want any information on our church, Jennifer Sims will be in that room, and she'll be free in just a few minutes. Y'all have a great night. Thank you.